Freedom is the only law and happiness is the only reality. I am here to divinely liberate all beings. I am here to grant true freedom to everyone. Freedom is the one of the principal words associated with the politics of this late time. The general trend toward the democratization of the entire world carries with it an intensified interest in the concept of freedom and in the pursuit of freedom. However, in the context and circumstances of, of this late time, the word freedom is used in such a way that the true import of the word is lost and its meaning is transformed and even vulgarized. The same process of vulgarization has also occurred in the case of other words such as, for example, the word love. The word love represents a profound concept and reality, but the word itself tends to be used very casually. People commonly say that they love this or that, meaning something quite different from, the, from what the word love rightly and truly signifies. Love is a word that rightly refers to the universal sacrifice of ego self. Real love is a matter of self-transcendence or going beyond your limitations in relation to others. But in the late time circumstance of vulgarized culture, the word love has come to be used in relation to whatever satisfies your inclinations or fulfills your desires, or otherwise somehow compensates for limitations in your life by pleasing you and thereby supporting your egoic disposition. None of that has anything to do with real love. So it also is with the word freedom and the notion of freedom. The world culture of this late time is essentially an ego culture associated with complications in the first three stages of life. It is essentially an adolescent culture and it is in the context of that culture that great words like love and freedom become vulgarized. In the adolescent disposition the word freedom like the word love is reduced to an egoic meaning. People say that they want to be free, or want to act freely, or want to be free to do this or that. But what they actually mean is that they want to be able to fulfill their desires without limitation. An adolescent reacting to parental authority or parental expectations regards any such authority or expectations to be oppressive or limiting. Therefore, such adolescents say that they want to be free, to be whatever they please. And that is, in general, what is meant in this late time by the word freedom. Even in the larger political sphere, the word freedom is used to express the personal and also collective intent to be able to fulfil desires and those desires are necessarily fundamentally ego-based. What does the fulfilment of desires have to do with true freedom? Rightly, the word freedom is synonymous with the word liberation. To be free or to be liberated means to go beyond bondage. The opposite of freedom is bondage. If one is truly moved to be truly free, one is moved to relinquish and, be go, and, be, and go beyond bondage. Such is the true wisdom understanding of freedom. In an earlier period of Western cultural history, there existed a wisdom tradition 
that was not associated with the vulgarized westernization or omegaization, characteristic of this late time. Thus, there is a higher disposition evident in the roots of Western culture, in that more ancient Western wisdom tradition, words such as love and freedom had a greater meaning. But to the vulgarized version or revision of a meagre culture, the higher disposition has become more and more eroded and has been and has even been all but entirely abandoned. True freedom is not rightly understood by the words and concepts of adolescence. Neither true freedom, nor real love, nor any other great concept. There must be human maturity, and therefore growth in wisdom, for the great meanings underlying these concepts to be understood and actually lived. It is right to want to be truly free, to want to be really happy. Like the words freedom and love, the words happy and happiness have also been vulgarized in the adolescent culture of the late time, wherein it is presumed that real happiness is merely a state in which one's desires are fulfilled. But where do your desires come from? What is the basis of them? This must be examined. Be moved toward real love without limit. Be moved toward real happiness without limit. Be moved toward true freedom without limit. You should and ultimately must be so moved but to actually realize love or real happiness or true freedom without limit, you must deal with yourself most profoundly. You cannot merely be reactive like an adolescent or a worldly person. If you want to be truly free, you must first understand that you are bound and you must understand how you are bound and then you must do something about that. If, on the other hand, you are merely reactively inclined to fulfil desires and you want to be so-called free to do so, then you are not examining your bondage, what its roots are, what its signs are, what its characteristics are. And if you are not examining your bondage with real discriminative intelligence, you are also not doing what you must do in order to be truly free. Merely to fulfil desires which are nothing but a web of ego-based inclinations arising out of all kinds of adaptations and reactions is not true freedom. Indeed, the search to fulfil desires is the essence of bondage. The more you involve yourself in that search, the more bound you become. Obega culture, in its vulgarized form, largely divorced from wisdom, serves the egoic and rather adolescent disposition that is common to mankind in this late time. In this predominantly adolescent era, there is very little understanding of the necessity for self-discipline, for cooperation, for true authority, for true religion, for resort to those who are true sources of wisdom. Such traditionally honoured values have become progressively more and more anathematized in this vulgarised culture that has been renouncing wisdom, both personally and collectively, and knocking wisdom down from its time-honoured pedestal and replacing it as the presumed source of meaning and rightness in life with the ego-bound, frightened, 
presumed to be independent individual. The individual human being is, in this late time or dark epoch, idealised to such an extent that each and every eagle eye is presumed to be some sort of perfect unit of independent absoluteness, a self-contained source of absolute desires and, desire and demands, toward which life itself is supposed to direct itself, and to the fulfilment or satisfaction of which life is supposed to be purposed. Therefore, the prevailing philosophy is that the eagle eye should be allowed to do whatever it pleases, and that by entirely fulfilling all its impulses, the eagle eye will show all the signs of perfection and will be really happy and really love and will be truly free. If you examine your life with any degree of seriousness and discrimination, you know very well that the philosophy of eager fulfilment is not how life or reality works. And yet, you are living in a worldwide culture that suggests that that is how life or reality works. That the eagle eye should simply be allowed to do whatever it pleases. And furthermore, that the collective of mankind should be organised to allow and even to serve the search of each and every eagle eye to fulfil its desires. This now common point of view in the world of politics is certainly something that you should be sensitive to. But this point of view is not something that has been inflicted on you by some kind of impersonal historical force. Rather, this point of view is the result of something you, as an eagle eye, are doing. You are self-invested in the egoic disposition, self-invested in the entire game of egoity, with its pursuit of survival and self and aggrandizement and as such you even become rather righteous about your egoity and readily submit to the vulgarization of great principles thus the ego i or egoic individual uses the word love relative to sexual objects and ice cream and whatever else he or she desires the ego I or, or egoic individual uses the word freedom to mean doing whatever he or she wants to do without anyone else deciding or determining what he or she will do. The ego I or egoic individual uses the word happiness to mean merely a state of psychophysical pleasure or a momentary release from stress. And supported by these cultural key words in the vulgarised meanings, the ego I or egoic individual feels that desire or seeking is what life is all about, and that, therefore, desire or seeking is what should be done. It is the general tendency of all of mankind alive in this late time to think and wander in this egoic, and seeking in self-serving fashion without wisdom bound to righteous individuality bound to motives of competitive individualism bound to the ego effort of organising life toward the potential moments of organic contentedness or relative release from stress bound to adolescent insistence on resisting authority, demands and the expectations of others and altogether bound to all the kinds of subhuman and otherwise merely gross human pursuits. Every ego eye or egoic individual must be truly converted in his or her fundamental disposition 
true and lasting positive change in the larger sphere of politics will begin to happen only when individuals and the collectors of all individuals start to actively counter-egoically understand the wisdomless dreadfulness to which all are submitting themselves in this late time or universally dark epoch. I am here to divinely liberate all beings, including necessarily all human beings, but that divine liberation is not accomplished by waving a magic wand. In order for my divinely liberating work to be effective, human beings must devotionally recognise me and devotionally respond to me, and thus and thereby rightly and actively counter-egoically understand themselves and be on that basis transformed in their disposition individually and more and more collectively and on this ego transcending and actively counter-egoic basis of devotion and self-understanding all those who have responsibilities relative to the larger collective political economic and social sphere must everywhere do what is right, good and positively transformative. When the entire human world founds itself on the adolescent motive to aggrandize the individual ego I, then everyone is collectively working toward the destruction not only of human culture and mankind itself, but even of the earth itself the very vehicle that supports life. The root of that terrible destructiveness is simply the aggrandizement and idealization of egoity and the illusion that the ego I is great. The late time Western world is full of propaganda about the individual ego I. In the cultural history of the West, the Renaissance, and the so-called Enlightenment period gave rise to idealistic doctrines about the human individual in which the individual was proclaimed effectively to be the epitome of everything great. There is a true greatness that is potential in the human case, both individual and collective, but such greatness requires great wisdom great movement beyond mere seeking desires or beyond the impulses of egoity and great renunciation of egoity or the ego I itself. Without great wisdom and great movement beyond egoity, the individual is necessarily ego-bound, separate and separative and therefore self-destructive and other-destructive deluded by desiring and suffering, self-created bondage. Therefore human beings must be transformed and they will not become transformed simply by taking off all the leash, leashes or removing all the governors and letting themselves run so-called free to do whatever they please. True freedom is not the political or social ability to do whatever one egoically pleases, but the discriminative and responsive capability to embrace the condition that is freedom itself. The only by me revealed and given way of Adidam, which is the only by me revealed and given way of the heart, is not politically or socially revolutionary because it is not a form of exoteric social religiosity. The way of Adidam is not a utopian or politically and socially idealistic way, nor is the way of Adidam associated with any effort to transform the world by force. The only by me revealed and given way of Adidam has arisen in my very freedom. The way of Adidam is not a political device for creating vulgarized or ego-based freedoms. The way of Adidam is not a political enterprise at all. The way of Adidam is not a matter of any kind of social struggle. 
The way of Adidam is a subjective matter, not merely a behavioural or social matter. The way of Adidam is a matter of true freedom in ultimate terms. All human beings are in a kind of perpetual school here. Every one and all must constantly grow. What ceases to grow dies or otherwise becomes obsolete. Therefore every one and all must constantly and actively, counter-egoically realise why and how to grow. It is right to feel the heart impulse to be truly free. Therefore be always purposed to be truly free. But constantly realise that you as the ego I are not truly free but bound. Therefore understand yourself and constantly do whatever you must do to become unbound. Do not merely exploit desires, but examine desires, examine everything, and locate the bondage that is the ego I, or self-contraction itself. In your counter-egoic effort to be truly free, you must specifically engage in counter-egoic action in relation to your own bondage or patterns of self-contraction. The mere exploitation of desire is bondage itself, dramatised. To remain in the dressing, to remain in the desiring and seeking disposition is to live the life of no discrimination, no revelation and no grace. That life is merely the attempt of the body-mind, body-based ego eye to survive and feel better. The life of ego I is not true freedom. True freedom is a matter of exercising the entire body-mind beyond self-contraction and thus beyond egoity and all the artefacts or results of egoity. True freedom is a matter of recognising and responding to the one who is freedom itself. Therefore, recognise me rightly, truly, fully and fully devotionally. Respond to me rightly, truly, fully and fully devotionally. Find me and locate me. Discipline yourself in devotional recognition response to me. Understand yourself by means of devotional communion with me. And thus listen to me and hear me and see me. In the total or formal, full and complete practice, of the only by me revealed and given way of Adidam, and in that great devotional process of always more and more profoundly recognising and realising me, be always more and more truly free in the always more and more profound realisation, and at last the most perfect demonstration of indivisible oneness with me. Reality is that which is always already the case. Reality is truth and the only real God. Reality, truth or real God is always and already. Reality, truth or real God is freedom itself, happiness itself and love or love bliss itself. Therefore freedom, happiness and love or love bliss are always already the case. Only the present time act of self-contraction or ego eye is dissociation from what is the case. Therefore, self-contraction is the act of the forgetting and the feeling of the non-experiencing or freedom of freedom, happiness and love or love bliss. In order to remember and experience freedom, happiness and love, or love bliss, it is necessary in every present time moment to surrender the ego eye or self-contraction and thus and thereby to be restored to what is. Therefore, this is the only and necessarily divine law or the law inherent in reality itself. The human being realises freedom, happiness and love or love bliss 
by means of always present time, self-surrender into the condition that always already is. And conversely, the human being suffers by means of always present time forgetting of that which always already is, and thereupon seeking for freedom, happiness and love or love bliss. All seeking for freedom, happiness and love or love bliss is necessarily ego-bound and necessarily ego-reinforcing or self-contracting and bondage-making and necessarily associated with psychophysical and space-time-bound efforts towards self-satisfaction and self-release or stress-release. But all present-time acts of self-surrender into the condition that is always already the case and that is inherent freedom, happiness and love or love bliss are always an inherently ego-transcending or effectively counter-egoic or self-contraction transcending and always directly body-mind transcending and space-time transcending and bondage transcending. The way of self-surrender into what is or who is is the divine and lawful way of life and the path of seeking for self-satisfaction and self-release is the path of self-contraction or egoity in bondage. I am the only one who is. I am that which is always already the case. I am the always present time given divine gift and the always present time given divinely perfect means of freedom, happiness and love. I am the bright, the divine love bliss itself. Therefore devotionally recognize me, devotionally respond to me, surrender and forget and really transcend all self-contraction by means of devotional communion with me and by thus devotionally realising me in every moment. Realise true freedom, real happiness and real love or the always already condition of divine love bliss.